Alright, what's going on everybody? Zombies here, and today we have a video taking a look at best decks to try out with the recently buffed and nerfed cards that we received in the OTA update the other day. So, taking a look at the changes here, four cards were changed, Lizard and Sandman were both nerfed, Lizard now providing minus four power if the opponent has a full lane as opposed to three before, and Sandman going from a 5-5 to a 5-3. Then there were also two cards we had buffed here, Shauna going up two power from a 4-2 to a 4-4, and Enchantress getting the same treatment going from a 4-4 to a 4-6. So this is the first round of OTA balance changes. OTA stands for over the air, and that just means that they can implement these changes without needing a major patch for the game. If you haven't heard already, Second Dinner is going to be doing a trial run of these changes roughly once a week on Thursdays throughout the month of May, so we can see how it has an impact on the game and hopefully adjust the meta in a healthy way. Before we dive into the decks here, I do want to mention that we have a companion article for this video, so if you do prefer a more written format, you can find that in the description below, which goes over the decks we're going to be seeing here as well as some others. And if you enjoy this type of content, consider liking and subscribing here to the Marvel Snap Zone YouTube channel. The first card we're going to be taking a look at here is Lizard. So Lizard was widely regarded as one of the best two drops in the game, five powers a lot, and quite a lot of the time you didn't really have to worry about the downside. So now Lizard, there is a bit more downside to him. Now he is a really understated two drop if the opponent can accomplish the condition. So where does this card find a home now, and are the decks that are currently using him going to stop running him? Well, for the most part, I don't think most of the decks, if any of the decks that run Lizard, are actually going to cut him over this change. I think this is going to open up some alternate consideration for two drops in some decks, but a lot of the places where Lizard was already finding a home, I don't expect him to disappear from. The deck that I think can make the most use out of this change, though, is the Sauron Shuri list that we have here from Safety Blade. Safety played this during the recent featured location of the Sandbar to much success. Obviously, having Sauron is a real benefit for that, but I think it also proved a point that maybe too many players immediately moved away from Shuri, in spite of her still being a fairly powerful option to consider in the meta. This list foregoes all protection options, as they have negative synergy with our Sauron here, in order to play some very powerful cards that normally have downside effects, such as Lizard, Ebony Maw, Typhoid Mary, and Red Skull. This list also has the benefit of being able to use the newly buffed Enchantress to a decent effect as it shuts off any of our negative ongoings, while also giving us the potential to snipe a powerful ongoing that the opponent might have in play. In my limited testing with this deck, it felt quite powerful, and I really do think that maybe too many people jumped off the Shuri ship, as happens when a powerful card gets nerfed in pretty much any card game. But if you're a Shuri enjoyer or you just like making things really, really big, this is probably a deck that's worth your consideration. It's possible that this deck gets even better given the fact that some players might be reconsidering their Shang-Chi slot in favor of Enchantress due to her recent buffs and the prevalence of powerful ongoing cards in the meta. I think this deck is currently criminally underrated and I would not be surprised to see it pick up in popularity in the near future after people start to realize, hey, even though we're playing with, what, three nerfed cards now, the deck still does some very powerful things, and uh, it's really hard to outpower it unless you have a flat answer like Shang-Chi to swing a lane. Here we can see that the big Red Skull plus Taskmaster combo plus a Sauron to Ebony Maw is enough to get the job done, even against decks that can put out a lot of power like Hela. Another deck I want to mention with Lizard here is the Sarah Control archetype, which he's found a home in for a while now. Lizard seems like he's going to continue to perform very well there, also due in part to the buffed Enchantress, making him guarantee stay as a 2-5. But on top of that, the deck has access to Killmonger, and oftentimes one of the cards in the lane that is being filled up for Lizard usually is a one drop if they're going to be filling up their lane that quickly. So Killmonger helps guarantee that at the end of the game, we can prevent them from shrinking our lizard, even if we don't have access to Enchantress. A lot of times with the Sarah Control deck, 
the power really is pretty close going to the end of the game, so these extra two points of power on Enchantress can be enough to make the difference sometimes. She can also be very clutch at dealing with awkward locations, as we can see here with the rickety bridge and the opponent's vibranium. And sometimes, even when you aren't able to get value out of the effect, she's still just a reasonable body to play for the cost. Speaking of Enchantress, let's talk about her a little bit and where she's going to be finding a home post-patch. So this was a pretty substantial buff. Ongoing cards have become more and more popular in the meta. We've started to see Enchantress pop up a little bit more, but it seems they weren't too happy with how poor of a tempo play Enchantress was, especially when you are not hitting an ongoing effect if there was just nothing to hit. So buffing her to a 4-6, pretty huge buff, gets her to that White Queen stat line. And I think we're going to be seeing this card a lot more often because of this, outside of the fringe appearance we would normally get from it in Sarah Control. The first deck we have to look at here for Enchantress is in the Doom Wave or the Death Wave style of decks. These decks are aiming to put out a lot of points of power, wave on turn 5, and then get down a powerful card to swing the game in addition to She-Hulk and or Death to outpower the opponent while limiting their options. Previously, in Death Wave and Doom Wave, Shang-Chi was a very popular addition. However, it could sometimes be awkward if things didn't line up correctly for getting a target for it. With the recent changes to the metagame, there have actually been a handful of less Shang-Chi targets around, so he has been dead a bit more often than not in hand, and on top of that with all the different ongoing cards going around, especially with all the Patriot, people have started to consider Enchantress in his place, and this additional buff of stats, making her a better tempo play, I think is going to further push Enchantress being run over Shang-Chi as a meta call in these decks. Choosing Doom Wave or Death Wave will always be a little bit of a meta call. Doom Wave definitely succeeding more at maintaining early tempo and using some powerful ongoing effects in order to gain priority. So you will have to be a little bit careful here about avoiding hitting your own ongoings but it's mainly just Darkhawk and Mr. Fantastic, so we can usually afford to play around playing these two cards in the same lane. I think Doom Wave is better at disruption and having a high amount of power going into the final turn, while Death Wave is better at dealing with things like board disruption and has a higher ceiling in terms of what it can accomplish power-wise on the final turn with the addition of Death. Even with the news of this Enchantress buff, it hasn't been enough to scare a lot of the good ongoing cards out of the meta, so it seems like a prime time for her to get as much value as possible, given how many popular meta decks run cards that are weak to her. Next up, let's take a look here at Shauna. So Shauna got, much like Enchantress, a plus two boost to her power. Definitely was a underplayed card before, but the main archetype that this had been seeing some experimentation with is in Zoo Lists, and that seems to remain the case with where she's most likely to shine the best. First list we have here is fairly budget friendly, being comprised of mostly cards from the first two pools. And uh, I do think Zoo holds up a lot better than people tend to give it credit for. It's just something that people play so much of in the early days. I find not a lot of players revisit the archetype later down the road, even though it is fairly powerful in its own right. Here we're making use of the fact that Shauna is able to get additional cards into our storm lane towards the end of the game, just in case things don't go how we're planning and we end up losing the storm lane as it shuts down. Other than that, it's just a collection of the most powerful things we can generally be doing at the one mana cost value, as well as things that support the fact that we're going all in with all these one drops going wide, such as Kazar and Blue Marvel. We're also running Armor and Cosmo to limit interaction from the opponent to hopefully cut down on the amount of times that we get blown out by Killmonger, the fatal enemy of all Zoo decks. Another take on the Zoo deck here is using Zabu to reduce some of our powerful four drops like Kazar, Shana, and Shang-Chi so we can get more stuff out for a lesser cost, as Zabu really isn't that bad of a tempo play. Ghost is another card that has recently rotated down to pool 4, and I think it's being slept on a bit in terms of its ability to guarantee your ability to either 
Shang-Chi while ahead on board during the final turn, or just helping you protect swarming out with a bunch of one drops or powerful ongoing effects in the final turn of the game, even if you would otherwise have priority. Though Ghost is a nice addition, she's definitely not core to this deck, you can very easily play this version without her, probably just want to toss in another tech card, such as armor, to help you be a little bit better against opposing Killmongers. It's definitely a very flexible list, and you can definitely do some tweaking to make it to your liking, or if you need some more budget inclusions outside of Shauna. Here we can see Shauna's ability to play into lanes that would otherwise be locked down is able to win us the game against a Galactus deck. Shauna also has a lot of utility in refilling our board if we do happen to get killmongered by the opponent. Tempo Shauna can sometimes be worth the risk too, though you do have to be careful for unexpected results like Ebony Maw. If you want to try going the more experimental route with Shauna, we can check out Safety's Shauna Sand Zoo. So this is uh, blending a whole lot of stuff together, but the idea with this is we're using another card here that was changed in this update, Sandman. Even though we got knocked down to power, really are just running Sandman for the effect. As you may have noticed, Patriot has no trouble getting underneath the Sandman. They don't really worry about the effect. So this deck seeks to leverage the power of early game decks like Zoo and have a Patriot move that it can pivot to with using Sandman to lock down other popular decks such as Sarah decks or some of the Death Wave and Doom Wave stuff we saw earlier. This one is definitely a little bit more in the experimental category, and I'm sure there is further refining and optimizing to be done here, but if you enjoy these board swarm style of decks and are looking for something a bit different to do with Shauna, this could be an interesting direction to try out. And speaking of Sandman, let's talk a little bit about what's happening to the final card here that was changed in this update. So Sandman did lose a little bit of power off the top. He's no longer as strong of a tempo play as he was previously at five power. Now he's a little bit more like his buddy Leech, where you are definitely taking a bit of a tempo loss for the very powerful effect of limiting how your opponent can play the final turn of the game, or even earlier, turn five, if you ramp him out. Sandman proved to be a very popular deck after the recent Shuri nerf, though its play rate has gone down since then, mainly due to counters popping up, such as Patriot, making it not quite as good as it initially was after the patch. I do think even with these changes, Sandman Ramp stands to be a very strong deck still, but you're probably going to want to make a few adjustments to utilize it to the best of your ability. The changes I've opted for here were removing Ebony Maw. So Maw, while I do think it is a powerful card in this style of deck, has gotten a bit weaker in recent weeks, mainly due to more Killmonger popping up. And when this deck is very heavily leaning on that additional seven power, losing it can just cost you the whole game sometimes. On top of that, sometimes it pairs pretty awkwardly with locations and makes it hard to execute your game plan in the best way possible. I've opted for Jeff as a replacement, as I do think he gives us some good flexibility in terms of where we are putting our power, which can be especially relevant when we're only playing one card a turn post Salmon. If you don't have Jeff, I do think it is totally fine to still run Ebony Maw, but if you find yourself being hit by a few too many Killmongers, it might be worth considering another good tempo 2-drop, such as Lizard. Another change you might notice is the exclusion of Leader. Leader was one of the things that brought the deck back to popularity as it seemed like an auto-include. However, I haven't found Leader to be overly impressive, and I do think the fact that Sandman is now a weaker tempo play means that Leader isn't going to consistently be able to win us the game when we're ahead. It's for that reason I've decided to re-include Leech here as a bit more redundancy to shut down the kinds of decks that we're targeting with Sandman in the games we don't happen to draw him. I've also found Jubilee to be very underrated in this archetype, mainly acting as a third piece of ramp in the games where we do not get our Electro or our Wave, and it has the added benefit of sometimes having a high roll potential if we're able to pull out Odin from our deck. Even with the slight change to Chavez recently, she still is a very important inclusion to this deck, as being able to more consistently get our ramp pieces early on in the game is often the difference between victory and defeat for this style of deck. 
Overall, I think the Sandman Ramp Shell is going to be playable and competitive, though maybe slightly less so than compared to before the patch. If you want more information about these decks or some more spicy brews with these cards, I definitely encourage checking out the article over on Marvel Snap Zone, which will be linked in the description. That's going to wrap it up for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Which of these decks are you most excited to try and brew with now that we've got the changes to these cards? And maybe which cards would you like to see changed in next week's update? If you enjoyed it, remember to like and subscribe and stay tuned to Marvel Snap Zone for all your Marvel Snap content.